so before uh, we, we go to the, the slides, I'm going to take opportunity to, uh, to take the opportunity to present him. So Miguel did his undergraduate uh, studies at the University of, uh, of Michoacán and the Universidad Michoacán in San Nicolás de Hidalgo in 1982. He then continued his doctoral studies at the John Shepherd's group at the University of British Columbia in Canada, graduating in 1988. After that, he did a postdoctoral stay uh, in, the, in joining Nicholas Turo's group at Columbia University before joining UCLA in 1992. Naturally, his research has achieved uh, international recognition and he has been focused on the study of uh, reactive intermediaries, solid state organic chemistry and photochemistry and uh, crystalline molecular machines. He has received many recognitions and awards uh, throughout his career. Uh, some of them are the following. He was an associate editor of the Journal of American Chemical Society. Then uh, uh, a couple of years ago, he was named an ACS fellow. And uh, last year, uh, he's, uh, he was uh, recognized as a member of the American American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He holds currently the, the Dean of uh, uh, Physical Organ Physical Sciences at Physical Sciences at UCLA. And more than that, I consider him a friend and a excellent advisor, supervisor, and a, a truly friend who has helped the Mexican community, Mexican scientific community along these years. Thank you, Miguel, for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Braulio. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I will share my slides now. Um, let's hope that everything is good. Go to presentation mode. How is that? Yeah, that's that's perfect. Yeah, we can see that. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I want to start just by not only thanking uh, specifically Braulio and Gabriel Merino for inviting me, but uh, really thanking uh, the, the large group of co-organizers uh, from all of the Latinx uh, community, both in Latin America and uh, in the rest of the world. So I'm, I'm really proud to be part of this community. It's a, it's a real pleasure. I debated what language to use for this presentation, and you see I have a, a, a initial slide in uh, Spanish, actually kind of Spanglish. I'm just noticing some errors there. Uh, I, but I thought that, you know, un, unless I could mix it with a little bit of Portuñol and, and others, probably it wouldn't work out as well. So I'm going to stick to English, if you don't mind. And this is the title I gave for my presentation. <clears throat> so my presentation today is intended to be sort of like a relatively didactic lecture where I'm going to be covering examples that are very old, some that are relatively new, and I may get to a couple of things that are unpublished. And what I'd like to do is to give you an idea, an outlook of solid state chemistry, in particular solid state photochemistry. So my presentation plan is a little long. I might have to end uh, uh, a little early, but I think it's uh, structured in a, in a way that I think I will be able to deliver my message, which is really uh, that uh, is, I feel working in crystals is extremely exciting. So, you know, when, when we think about crystals, uh, the, the general practice, the general mindset is that crystals are really nice to have because you can put your molecule in a vial. It will stay stable for a long time. You can use it for crystal structure. So typically you want to get nice, chunky, big crystals that you can put in the diffractometer and get some beautiful structure that will uh, adorn your manuscript and also give you some structural information. Today, I want to emphasize the fact that these crystals are really nice and beautiful, and etc. Uh, but if we use nanocrystals, <clears throat> these are crystals that are somewhere between 20 to 40 nanometers in the low end and maybe half a micron in the low end, so 500 nanometers. Uh, there is a lot of opportunities that make it possible to use uh, solid state photochemistry under conditions that are just the same as the ones we would use in, in solution media which makes it incredibly simple and friendly and easy to apply. 
So here, here we see an, another image when that uh, and another thing that you know we, we like crystals because there is a lot of applications that one can use. We just saw the talk by Diego Solis on perovskites and uh, the fact that you know the composition that you have in those crystals comes together to to uh, create some emergent properties is something really special. So this uh, type of organization is is uh, fundamental. In my group, we're interested in crystals because we can uh, plan, control chemical reactivity. We can do green chemistry. We can take advantage of exit and diffusion to look at quantum chains. And we can look at mechanistic aspects by looking at precise structural reactivity relation. We have a program that I will not cover today on uh, materials, crystalline materials, that we're looking at magnetism, multiferroics, molecular rotors. Uh, and molecular machines. So today we're gonna focus on basically on the top uh, four components. Now, if we think about it, the one thing that is probably most general and most common to most crystals is that they're characterized, especially molecular crystals, right? They're characterized by molecular order, molecular rigidity, and molecular homogeneity. That is, there is a very large reduction of entropy. If you imagine the total entropy of a, of a liquid, Right? when you have an innumerable number of configurations, conformations, uh, collisional states, uh, normal modes, et cetera, et cetera, the entropy, is just the, the entropy content is very high. And when that liquid crystallizes, uh, what happens is that everything collapses into a single structure. <clears throat> and the total number of states that are available uh, in that structure are significantly reduced. So the first thing to recognize is that there is a, an enormous reduction of entropy. Well, let us, let us think a little bit about more, right? So if we think about entropy, we, the, the first thing that comes to mind is thermodynamic entropy as defined by Clausius. So we would measure the heat content of our sample at a given temperature. And we have a number, you know, it could be, <clears throat> I don't know, could be um, 150 uh, calories uh, per Kelvin. And when you do that, what you find is that it's possible that all of the crystals, all the beautiful crystals that I have in my image there, I actually have a very similar thermodynamic entropy. So the thermodynamic entropy is useful when we're looking for phase changes, changes of state, things like that. Uh, you know, when we're looking for a, uh, the entropy of activation, for example, that is useful, right? When we are making comparisons, but the entropy per se is not particularly useful if we use thermodynamic entropy. Now, what about statistical entropy as defined by Boltzmann, right? So this, this basically gives you the same number, but here the, the, the analysis is different. The PI in Boltzmann's, Boltzmann's equation represent the states of our system. And by states, we can look at the diagram on the bottom left. We're talking about you know, the different uh, vibrational, rotational, translation, and spin state that every molecule can occupy within a sample. So if we think about a perfect crystal, acido Kelvin, all of the molecules are in the same state. So the fraction PI is one and the logarithm of one is zero. And that's what we know that the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin is by definition zero. If we begin to in introduce some heat, we begin to populate states. And now the PI, the fractions of those populations begin to get smaller and smaller. The, the entropy begins to get larger and larger. So at, at zero Kelvin, we start with the dot in the center. Then we have a crystal and our crystal begins to, under, uh, to, to experience lattice vibrations and normal modes and others. So the entropy of the crystal begins to grow. The more heat, the more states are populated. Until then we have enough heat to have a phase transition in what we go into the liquid phase. So the entropy of the liquid begins to grow as we put more heat higher temperatures until it boils. And then we have the entropy of the gas that can increase also, right? So thermodynamic entropy tells us that the entropy of the gas is more than the entropy of the liquid, more than the entropy of the solid. And I said, that's not very useful because what is interesting to recognize is that actually the states that we have in the gas, in the liquid, and in the solid are actually not identical. So we're talking about different states of our system, right? So what that does for us is that, uh, let me change here, is that 
we can change the, no, uh, as we change the state of matter, we're also changing the number of states that are available. So we're changing the information content of our sample. And what I'm saying is that the, the amount of the statistical entropy of a crystal is smaller. The information content is also smaller, but it's more precise. We have a lot more precise information. It is interesting to recognize that the, the, the Boltzmann equation is identical to the Shannon equation that describes the information content of an information source. So it, it is intriguing to think about. So how do we go about thinking about information and entropy and the statistical entropy in chemical system? Well, let me show you a really old example from my group. We're gonna look at the photochemists of uh, carbines. So these are aryl alkyl carbines. As you can see, we have a, an, an, uh, a diazo compound on the left, photochemically that goes in the carbine. The carbine can exist in a triplet and a singlet state. So four states actually, because triplet is three and one singlet. They have different reactivities so that in solution it goes on to give at least four products. And if it, depending on the solvent, it gives many more products. So if we look at the top right, we are in the liquid phase. The, the configurational entropy is high. We have a high statistical entropy system that is to low selectivity and low yields in solution. To analyze that a little closer, we can look at a Newman projection of our molecule along the bond between the diisocarbon and the alpha carbon. And that gives us something like that. So we will have a number of conformers that are under equilibrium uh, and they will be occupied depending on their energetics. Once we bring light, each of those conformers can correlate with a different carbon structure. The carbons may or may not equilibrate. That's gonna be part of the entropy of our system. And each of those carbons can give to rise to a different product. Some too slow, so we are not observed. So this is when we have a system of, uh, with a high statistical entropy. So what's gonna happen when we have a phase transition and we go from the nice big green circle to say a blue circle? Ah, we have a large reduction of entropy, right? So what the crystal has done for us is has reduced the statistical entropy, selected the system so that we can have one carbon, one diazo compound that goes to one carbon and one product. So what our beautiful ruby red crystal do for us is make our system much more tractable, more understandable, and really chemically more well-defined. So that when we do the reaction in the crystal, we can see that the crystal structure of the diazo compound correlates beautifully and uniquely with the crystal structure of the photo product in a least motion pathway. And we can do that in over 96% yield. So you, you can see here how a, a nice fine powder changes before and after reaction. And what you can see is that as a function of reaction progress, the selectivity of the reaction remains very high. We have excellent selectivity and high yields in the crystal state. So the question is, well, so how do you go about, you know, designing reactions in crystals? So what crystals are gonna react and what crystals are not going to react? So this is the strategy that we use in my research group and I invite you to test it. So the way we engineer reactions in crystals is by a very simple strategy. We identify substrates with intrinsic mechanistic pathways that upon excitation are able to break and make new bonds, even in a highly restricted environment, which is by the way, what photobiology does. So photosynthesis, vision, all photobiology has schemes that look like this. So biology has developed this already very well. In our case, the molecular, the information contained at the molecular structure level determines the reaction energetics. So what we see there, excitation and then going up in a downhill stepwise process is what the molecular structure is going to do for us. What the crystal structure is going to do for us, that, that information is gonna determine the reaction trajectory. And that's what you will see in the examples that I will talk today. So this is a really good, scheme to keep in mind if you want to play a little bit with reactions in crystals. Now, let me tell you about some interesting history that I think you will enjoy. So uh, that, uh, this gentleman, Leopold Ruchiska, who is well known, is a fantastic chemist of the early uh, 20th century. He won the Nobel Prize in 1939 for his work on therapy natural products. But he was critical, so you know, he, he, he was saying, well, you know, chemistry only occurs in gases and liquids. And he is uh, famous in my community, in the solid state photochemistry community, among other th things, because he said, in German, of course, ein Kristall ist ein Friedhof, 
which means a crystal is a cemetery. So that, that you know, and that's probably true for many crystals, right? I showed you this picture before, and I guess you can see the analogy, right? So here we have a cemetery and the, the tombs are nice, beautifully arranged. And you can say, well, yeah, all of our molecules are dead in the solid state, right? So they're, they're dead. If you want to revive them, you have to put them in solution or in the gas phase, and then you can see reactivity. Well, is that true? Actually, that is just not true. And that's been known for a very long time. So the first history involves this, uh, this uh, a, a, a plant, it's called Artemisia china, and these two gentlemen, gentlemen Bartholomew Stromsdor and Charles Pfizer, and sunlight is gonna play a role. So we start with, by recognizing the fact that Artemisia is a, is a plant that is distributed globally. And if you make a tea out of Artemisia, you, your tea will prevent or will cure warm infections, so helminthic in infections. So it's a, a, a helminticide, I suppose, is what would be called. But what Transfer did is he, he took the plant, he extracted the, the plant, and he was able to isolate these beautiful crystals or beautiful crystals like this, right? So Transfer isolated and studied these crystals. He, he happened to put his crystals on a little bottle and put them by the window. And what he discovered is that these crystals turned yellow and began to crumble and began to become a powdery. So something was going on there was a photochemical reaction happening. And that's the first photochemical reaction ever uh, reported. So a few years ago, we repeated the transform experiment uh, you know, in our lab, and this is how we set it up, right? So there is uh, some santon in crystals in the microscope. We, we have a camera, we're taking pictures. UV light is coming on. Uh, what you will see is something like this. We will turn on the light. And this is what transform saw. Look at these crystals, they're moving all over. The, the crystals are jumping in and out. These crystals are not only, undergo, not only undergoing a photochemical reaction, they're transducing molecular energy into macroscopic energy, something that is called photosalience, a really interesting phenomenon. If we, we, we look at the, at the reaction by, with single crystal X-ray diffraction, and here you can see how the, the molecules in the reacting santonin crystal transform into crystals of this photosantonin dimer. So we can say that, well, all that those crystals needed is some light to come back to life, right? So they, they were not so dead after all. So the next part of the story comes actually with uh, Charles Pfizer, who's another German uh, who immigrated to the United States. And he knew about santonin. He knew that, you know, it, 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 it was used as a, uh, for, for, for warm infections, and he knew that Bartholomew Strasser had isolated. So he came up with the idea of mixing santonin with toffee to make some pills that could be given to the children instead of taking that very awful bitter uh, tea that they were given otherwise. And that's how the first pharmaceutical company was originated. So it turns out that santonin has some really interesting story. That was in the 1830s and 50s, right? So, uh, 40 years later, Giacomo Chamisian in Bologna did a large number of photochemical reactions, uh, not only in solution, but so also in the solid state. And he, he envisioned that the photochemistry of the future was gonna be really important, that the sunlight was gonna play a role. So it's interesting, right? So we have a chemical reaction, we have emer emerging phenomena. We can take molecular information into the microscopic world, something that is called salience. And here is an example of the same santonin crystals. We're gonna put light with a, with a focus laser in a point and see what happens. When the reaction occurs at some point, the energy that is stored internally in the crystal as a function of these structural changes can be transduced into ballistic mechanical information in those microscopic crystals. So the fact is that actually, our crystal, crystal comes alive. Well, not that crystal, right? We wanna change crystals. These are the crystals that come alive. And there's a lot of beautiful examples of those. And I have a couple of examples shown here. The top example is a crystal reported by Professor Masahiro Irie in Japan quite, quite some time ago. It's a photosalient reaction. And the one below is by our chairman, uh, Professor Rodriguez Molina, was look at some beautiful examples of thermal salience where thermal energy in the form of phase transition translate into macroscopic uh, jumping and different types of motion. 
let us get back to natural products and synthesis. So one of the major challenges in synthesis is the preparation of compounds with adjacent stereogenic quaternary carbons. And I'm showing a few of those examples here. There is a major challenge because the synthesis of these compounds require many steps that are very poor stereochemical control. They're very difficult to purify because the, the reactions are so messy, the yields are low, which makes them to have a very low cost. So what is it about having two adjacent quaternary carbons that makes them difficult? Well, it's nothing but, but sterics, right? The fact that it's very hard to bring anything where, where something is already very congested. So the idea that we had in my group so a long time ago is what if we could take a, something cheap and simple like acetone and transform it into the type of adjacent quaternary centers that we see here. So that became a strategy of taking advantage of a photochemical reaction that is called a photodecarbonylation reaction. Here is an example of such a reaction. So this is an experiment carried out uh, at UCLA in, the, in, in one of the gardens that was uh, in January. So that's the middle of the winter. After two hours exposure, this uh, ketone with two uh, alkenyl substituents, when we expose light, two bonds are broken, uh, a biradical is formed, and that biradical car carries the molecular information, and then the crystal makes sure that we get the stereoselective formation of the carbon-carbon bond, a relatively simple transformation. So this is really the message, right? My message, one of my messages today is that molecular information determines reaction energetics and crystal information determines reactant trajectories. In this case, the trajectory is to preserve the stereochemical integrity of the reactant into the product. So here we have a cyclohexadienon. We see the crystal, beautiful translucent crystal in the, in the top left. We see the crystal structure with the Van der Waals envelope. So our molecule has been selected to, 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 to produce a natural product called cuparenone or alpha cuparenone. By taking advantage of this mechanistic uh, diagram, this energetic diagram. So this is what this molecule contains within its own genes. It contains enough excitation energy to make an excited ketone. That excited ketone has an alpha bond that is so weak that it's going to cleave to make, to make this acyl alkyl by radical. Now that acyl alkyl by radical, the two electrons are looking at each other. So you think, well, it's just gonna go back to the reactant. Actually, no, because this ketone is preparing the triplet state that cannot go back to the, ket to the reactant. So instead what it does is set up for a second bond to be cleaved to go to the by radical two. That's what molecular information is doing for us. Now that we have the, the by radical, the crystal is gonna keep the configuration of that radical to go on to the final product. Because if we were to do it in solution, the molecule will do its job, right? But the molecule is now in a very high entropy state in a liquid phase, and it's gonna explore many different conformations and configurations, right, with solvent and so on, and we're gonna get completely different products. So in this case, our crystal is doing what an enzyme we do in a photochemical uh, or photobiological reaction. We have no solvent, no metals, no reagents, quantitative yield, and no purification. So this is a wonderful reaction. However, not just as shown, right? The, if you see this particular, uh, uh, ex, what, what you see in this image is that our beautiful translucent crystal becomes all opaque, loses, loses its translucency. What that means is that light is not penetrating through very easily. So it would be difficult to scale up this reaction if you think about it, it will be also very difficult to measure the kinetics of that reaction, to measure the quantum yields, or to do even any type of spectroscopy. All of those challenges have their origin in things like the very high optical density and the optical properties of crystals, which includes dichroism, birefringence, and of course, a lot of scattering, right? So it's very difficult to introduce light into the crystal, and it's difficult to measure how much light's come in. However, all of these properties are size dependent and they're a function of the ratio between the crystal size and the wavelength. That means that the smaller the crystal size, the smaller the problem is. One solution would be to use fine powders, right? So we use fine powders, put them in the floor again, and we can do this reaction. It works pretty well, actually. So, you know, we can do a, a 100 milligrams in each of those uh, glass plates. It's good, but it's just not enough, right? 
if we were to use you know, dry powders in a tumbling or flowing apparatus, it wouldn't work. Uh, they, will, they will tend to cake and eventually melt. So what we came up is uh, with a different solution, which is nanocrystals, prepare nanocrystals suspended in a non-dissolving fluid. That should help address these challenges. The strategy is very simple, right? So instead of having a large microscopic crystal, we want to split that into trillions of nanocrystals and suspend them in water. In, the, in this uh, scanning electron microscopy image, you can see that the crystals are on the order of 50 to 100 nanometers, and that's perfect. Under those conditions, our crystals in, uh, in water look like milk because they're a colloidal suspension. Uh, it looks milk, of course, because white light is being scattered, right, of all colors, and that's what they look like. The way they are prepared is, really, is very simple. It was actually developed by uh, Kasai and uh, at Nakanishi in Japan in 1992. The idea is to dissolve the sample, your, your molecule, in a small amount of a water-soluble solvent, for example, acetonitrile, THF, or ethanol, and add that, into a in, add that solution into vigorously stirring or vorticing water. So when we have low loading, we have transmission of light and we can do spectroscopy. When we have high loading, we can do photochemistry. We can determine the, the characteristics of our nanocrystals by using dynamic light scattering, atomic force microscopy, scanning electron microscopy, or we can centrifuge our crystals and collect them to, to get a powder X-ray diffraction pattern. Here's an example, uh, actually, of a, of a reaction that uh, we, where we scale up. This was actually done by Lupita Hernandez, who's in the audience, and her husband, Gabriel. So they, they, decided, they came to UCLA for, for a sabbatical, and Lupita and Gabriel decided to work on, on a large-scale photochemical process using uh, a, a, a flow system. So using uh, a photoenzymatic desimatrization and a simple chemistry, they prepared large amounts of this chiral ketone with uh, six substituents in the alpha carbons. In the bottom, you can see the crystal structure of the reactant, the reacting ketone and the photoproduct. The reacting ketone is chiral, the, the protoproducts is also chiral. And this is how they did it, right? So they devised a reactor that, that has basically the, the, the opportunity to pass the light through the, through, uh, the suspension through a reactor and then through multiple passes have a, a really efficient reaction. Where when they collected this, uh, this product, what they saw is that the, the, the test sample in solution in the top as you can see, the NMR spectrum has literally dozens of products, meaning that it has uh, dozens of, of, uh, of uh, different peaks from different products, a very messy reaction when you have a high entropy system, many configurations, many opportunities for reactions to take place. When you do it in a crystal, what you see in, in the bottom, you see the, the proton NMR of the crude sample, which is just perfect. If you just look at the metoxic signal in the middle of the spectrum here, you can see that that corresponds to that carbon, and that tells us that the, the reaction in, solu in the solid state in the nanocrystals is just perfect, which is wonderful. Now, let me tell you that for these reactions to be so good, there is a couple of things that we need to consider. These are important. Uh, we need to mind the gap. So what's the gap? That's the gap between the liquid region and the solid region of the phase diagram. So if we have a pure crystal of a reactant and it's gonna become a pure crystal of the product, we need to walk a phase diagram of a two component system. Something most of us learn in general chemistry, learn again in physical chemistry, and then many of us tend to forget. Well, Denise de la Era, who is uh, from San Luis Potosí in Mexico and also came to UCLA, did a number of experiments to test, uh, to test some of these ideas. If you look at the phase diagram here, everything that is now covered in blue is that there is liquids there. Right? We need to avoid that. So let's say that you start with a solid. So you start a reaction at some temperature, indicated by that arrow, and you start on the light. And what you see is that you start in the solid, but then you go into a region where there is a liquid when you cross this line and so at some composition. So there is going to be melting. And then here, there is going to be recrystallization. Let's take a look at that. Here we have an example of a fine powder. We're gonna turn the light on. And we're still gonna see what happens. Our reaction begins to happen. We are not below the eutectic point. So we go into the liquid region of the phase diagram. 
uh, and then the reaction C goes on, and then the product begins to recrystallize. But our reaction was very messy. This reaction was not very clean. In fact, this reaction lost the structural information of the crystal, and there were many reaction trajectories that could happen. So we need to avoid that. If you want a nice, clean photochemical reaction, you need to go below the eutectic point. I'll remind you that the eutectic point is the lowest temperature where you can see liquids and solids. So if you go below the eutectic, then you can be good. I have an example of that, but to show you that example, I'm gonna take the, an opportunity to show you another really special reaction in the solid state. A reaction that we call a quantum chain reaction, which is a, it can be viewed as a, as a photon amplification system. We're using the same mechanistic information. We know that in this case, we have one or two intermediates, probably just one intermediate, but it's not able to go back to the starting ketone because once a bond is broken, it releases ring strain and just it just cannot go back. So the diphenyl cyclopropinone that you see on the left once excited, goes on to give acetylene or diphenyl acetylene plus, car plus carbon monoxide. What's cool about this reaction is that the, the quantum yield is 3.3, .3, meaning that for every photon that, that is absorbed, there is 3.3 .3 reaction. So that's a quantum chain. What makes this reaction special is that this reaction proceeds along the excited state. This is what we call an excited state adiabatic reaction. So we go to the S2 of the cyclopropinone, and in about 200 femtoseconds, it goes to the S2 of diphenylacetylene. So diphenylacetylene is the product and is still excited. After about eight picoseconds, it will start to decay, but it has, it has eight picoseconds where it can do something interesting, which is transfer energy. So imagine a crystal where we have a number of diphenyl cyclopropinones. We excite one of them very quickly. Within a few femtoseconds, we have an excited state. That excited state in about 200 femtoseconds is going to react to give an excited diphenyl acetylene. So we see now that the energy gap in the diphenyl acetylene in the blue is larger than the energy gap on the neighboring diphenyl cyclopropinone on black. So we will see a very fast energy transfer. At this point, we're got, we have one product and still one excited state. So what's gonna happen here is that the quantum chain will proceed in a way that excitation will be transferred from one molecule to the next. And this will happen during the lifetime of excited state. So in this case, it's about eight reactions per photon. All right, now this is a, these are some crystals of diphenyl cyclopropinone. This is a quantum chain reaction, so this is a really efficient reaction. And see what happens if we do this reaction well below the eutectic point, where we're showing here with the green arrow. Here, here it goes. This reaction is obviously it's completely destroying the, the reactant phase, and it's going into the product phase, into the diphenyl acetylene phase. But it's a solid to solid reaction. So, so that the time scale for recrystallization of the product must be very fast. But you can see how efficient solid state reactions can be. So I, there is really a lot of potential there. So when we look at the possibility of synthesis of natural products, our photoorganic synthesis, again, we're using the mechanistic scheme, right? The molecular information gives, gives us the reaction energetics and the crystal controls the trajectory. And here we see the synthesis of cuparinone, herbertinolite, and tochunyl acetate, three sesquiterpenes, all of them have adjacent stereogenic quaternary centers. And the key step of each of these reactions is a solid state photo photodecarbonylation. I will not go into much detail about that because you can find this in the literature. But I wanna share with you something that is very recent. This we just published uh, uh, the, uh, this year and last year. The synthesis of a very non-trivial, a very complex natural product called psychotriadine. So look at the complexity of this, uh, this compound, right? It's, uh, you know, you see that there is an adjacent quaternary center, there is four heteroatoms, it's chiral. Our retrosynthesis is based on, on one solid state reaction going back to this ketone. And you see the key reaction here in the crystal. So we prepare this uh, dibromo, uh, ketone inter, uh, a precursor, photochemically, 
loses carbon monoxide and gives us this compound. And in a couple of steps, we get to a, this critical intermediate that is all set up so that spontaneously, basically, can go into the nearly into the into the natural product. So that can illustrate a little bit uh, the sort of things that we can take advantage of by doing reactions in crystals. Here is a, a computational model where we can see how the trajectory of the bond recombination may lead to the desired product, although sometimes it might lead to something that is not desired. And if you want to read about that, you would have to look at the 2021 JAX paper that was published just a few months ago. What about doing a spectroscopy? So about what about learning some of the reaction mechanisms of these uh, processes? Well, this, is, this, this slide just illustrates that we can measure the excited states. We can detect the excited states of molecules in crystals. So in this simple example, we have bands of nanocrystal suspended in water. And the beautiful blue glow that you see is the phosphorescence of bands of nanocrystals at room temperature. Here we see how by using nanocrystals, we can detect the phosphorescence in the bottom left. We can compare the phosphorescence of the nanocrystals with the phosphorescence in the bulb. On the top right, we can see that we can collect the UV spectrum by doing transmission spectroscopy. And if we do scanning electron microscopy, you can see that these crystals are about 200 nanometers, which is again, smaller than the wavelength of light that we're using, that in this case is 355 nanometers. Because we can detect uh, we can do transmission spectroscopy. If we use femtosecond uh, lasers, we can excite our molecule and detect the, the transition from the singlet excited state to the triplet excited state, which is shown here on the, the kinetic uh, trace on the left. We go from the singlet to the triplet in, in a growth or intersystem crossing that takes about 10 picoseconds. If we use a nanosecond laser, then we begin to count when we're in the triplet state, and now we can measure the decay of the triplet back to the singlet. And as you can see, that happens in about five microseconds. And we can measure the spectrum of the triplet, so the triplet one to triplet n spectrum. So we can characterize the kinetics of this type of intermediates in the crystal state by taking advantage of these nanocrystals. What about the kinetics of these reactions that I've been talking about, right? These photodecarbonylation reactions. So this is what it looks like. This is what I illustrated, right? So we go from a ground state ketone to an excited state ketone that is supposed to cleave a bond in the triplet state to give a triplet radical, we're calling radical pair, we're calling RP1. And that is supposed to very quickly break the second bond to give RP2, what we call I1 and I2 on the top uh, left, uh, on the top right diagram. Putting something, some uh, molecular information, we can have something like this. <clears throat> so let's say we start with this ketone that has phenyl groups on the alpha carbon. So these bonds here become really quick, very weak. So we excite our molecule and we have a very fast alpha cleavage, gives RP1. And then we have a very fast decarbonylation to get RP2. So in this case, we can very quickly get into the I2 intermediate or RP2. And we can measure the kinetics of intersystem crossing from RP2, from triplet RP2 to singlet RP2, which then go on, goes on to give the product. And that's what happens, right? So we, we're, in this case, we're using a neodymium jack laser at 266 nanometers. We have a 10 nanosecond pulse. And we can see that the kinetics of this radical pair decay in a time scale of about 40 to 90 microseconds, depending on the nature of R. But there is a fast component that decays about 10 microseconds. We're still studying the origin of this double exponential kinetics. But the interesting fact is that this, these radical pairs have a very long lifetime, despite the fact that the two radicals are so close to each other in the crystalline state. So you know these two radicals in the intermediate are no more than maybe two and a half angstroms apart from each other. Now, what if we change the molecular information, right? And we make it difficult to decarbonylate. So we take a ketone, where we select the, we select the R substituent shown in blue. We go to the excited ketone, right? So we, we call it here triplet one. There is an alpha cleavage reaction that makes our first by radical. And then we make it unfavorable to lose carbon monoxide. So if you look at the top right diagram, I2 now is higher than I1. 
So what that means is that we've, we've trapped I1, which is a triplet acyl alkyl biradical. And now what we can do is we can look at the kinetics of that biradical coming back to the starting ketone. In other words, we can look at the rate of intersystem crossing. How long is it gonna take from one of those spins to flip from being the same spin to have one of them to the other spin. So we go from the triplet to the singlet and then we can make a bond. We look at a number of ketones that you can see on the bottom and uh, we can get really quite interesting and valuable information on all of these. If you think about it, this, this, we're asking a lot, right? So we're, uh, what we're asking in this case is we're asking the molecule to contain the information to break a bond, even though it's in a close pack crystal. So that when that bond breaks, those two electrons are gonna be very, very close to each other. In fact, they're gonna be basically a bond distant away from each other. This is as close as you can put two unpaired electrons, really, unless you put them you know, on the same molecular frame. But for a ra radical pair, you cannot go any closer than this. What are the consequences of having two electrons so close to each other? Well, the, what's gonna happen is that if you think about this diagram, you look at the, the, the red line, that's the, the, the energetics of the triplet ketone as it begins to separate and it's trying to break the bond. The black line represents the singlet state, right? When, when the bond is gonna come back. However, when we break that bond in the crystalline, in our radical pair intermediate, it's in such a way that the energy of the singlet is far from the energy of the triplet. And the three triplet sublevels are gonna be spaced out because the dipolar interaction between each other is gonna give rise to a large zero field splitting. What that means is that since the, if you look at the bottom uh, box, if the single triplet energy difference is too large, we cannot have the, one of the common mechanisms for intersystem crossing is hyperfine coupling, which is coupling the electron spin with the nuclear spin. That cannot happen. The energy is not appropriate. Now the radical orbitals are collinear and that's just not good for a spin orbit coupling. For a spin orbit coupling, we need that exchange of, uh, between two electrons change, uh, produces some, uh, some uh, magnetic moment, some torque, and this is not happening if they're aligned. We have two different G factors that may help. And then the crystal rigidity will limit any possibility of spin lattice relaxation for those two spins to spontaneously relax thermally. So what we discover is something truly remarkable. What we discover is that yes, we can look at these radicals. We can see that the spectrum is quite nice and the decay is incredibly long. So up to 63 microseconds for two electrons that are staring at each other. This is truly unprecedented. So this is the longest lifetime for an acyl alkyl radical pair and biradical. What that means is that these electron spins are very strongly correlated, very strongly entangled. And that brings us interesting opportunities in the field of quantum computing. For quantum computing, we, we're gonna need well-precise, well-defined quantum states. And the, the, the current uh, uh, type of uh, quantum computing is based on semiconductor, basically on, on, on junctions. Uh, it, it can also be based on trapped ions. And there is a lot of efforts in using spins. The problem with quantum computing is that noise is really, really challenging, right? So the energy differences are so tiny that noise becomes a, a real problem. In this case, it's possible that noise might, be, might not be so important. Now, the, the Vicenzo's criteria includes scalability, which we think it could be possible in a macroscopic crystal. In the, 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 the qubits need to be in, in, in initialist initial is small, which we can do with a laser here. We need long the coherent time so that the, the, the different spins of levels can have long lifetimes. We need quantum gates, and that could be accomplished through microwave and, and optical excitations, which could be both, both for the gates and for the reading. So the fact that we have the longest lifetime for acyl alkyl radical pairs and by radicals, and that these two electron spins are strongly correlated, make them actually pretty promising. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end there so that we, I, I've gone a little quick, but I, I, I'm gonna take a, a, a message from Diego Stock and leave enough time for talks. 
And I want to end really with this slide, right? Which is, uh, you know, it's not a summary of what I talked about, but it's conceptually, I think, the most important concept, right? That crystalline solids give us probably the, the simplest way to control the macroscopic entropy of a system that the, the, the molecular structure and the crystal structure combined contain chemical information that can be used to take advantage of for a number of possibilities, for chemical reactivity, for materials applications, perhaps for quantum computing and others. So I think it is, it, this is a really interesting and exciting field. Uh, I, I, I've seen this field grow. Uh, I, I think there is a lot of very talented people working on it. And I, and I hope uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, you will agree on that. Now, among the very talented people that have contributed to my group's research, uh, we see a very nice picture here. We see actually Braulio here on the, on the left when he was uh, uh, a postdoc in my group. Uh, <clears throat> so we, we, we also hear uh, Salvador Perez, also from, from Mexico. And uh, there's been a, a really large number of uh, postdocs, grad students and visiting scientists and uh, colleagues in other institutions who are contributing to this work. So I'm very, very grateful to all of them for their contributions. And I'm very grateful to all of you for listening to my talk and to the organizers for putting this incredible event together. So I'm gonna end there, I'm gonna stop sharing and I will be happy to answer any questions that uh, anybody might have. Thank you, Braulio. Thank you very much, Miguel. Uh, so um, it is it is time for uh, uh, there, there there are a couple of minutes for uh, the audience to ask questions. I, I already have one question from the audience. Uh, Professor Maria Rosales Oz from Simvestab asks. Yeah. So what happens if you have a polymorphic forms uh, during these uh, uh, reactions? Do they react similarly or? Mm. Well, first of all, uh, uh, hello, Mary. It's uh, nice that you're uh, part of the audience. Uh, so thank you for uh, coming to my talk. Uh, that, that is a fantastic question. So different poly polymorphs, even though they may have the same molecule and the same molecular information, they, they contain, may contain different trajectories. All right? So if a crystal is racemic, you would get a racemic sample. If a crystal is homochiral, you get a, uh, an antiomerically pure sample. Now, when, when you have bimolecular reactions, then polymorphism is really important because there could be a polymorph that sets up the two reagents in the right distance and orientation and another form polymorph that doesn't. And, and that is the, 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 the case in the very classic uh, photochemistry of the synamic acids, which really are part of the, the, the history of the field. So you're absolutely right. They, they may react similarly, but if, uh, if the if the trajectory is imposed by the crystals can be different, then you can see different reactivities. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, we have time for more questions from the audience. I'm, I'm going to check uh, because they're like also asking uh, from the YouTube channel, and sometimes I I miss those as uh, so those those questions, but. Um, yeah, well, uh, maybe maybe it's uh, it's time for for another question here. Yeah, well, Miguel, I I really is is really amazing what uh, you can do with uh, with a very uh, quick instrument that measures all the, these transients. But uh, those those instruments are not. I mean, it's not it's not. Uh, I, I don't recall the name of the instrument that, that you you got at the, at the like around 2013 that where, when you can measure right. these uh, transient. Uh, so how do you measure it? I don't recall. Really. In the organic chemistry community, is generally referred to as a laser flash photolysis approach. Laser flash. All right. In the physical chemistry community, they refer to it more commonly as a pump prof system. So you know. Uh, uh, in Mexico, we have some really uh, very talented uh, kineticists like, uh, like the director of the institute, Jorge Peón, who use, uh, use these techniques uh, to, to look at that very fast kinetics. Uh, 
But in that case, in that scenario, you will have to to work with uh, a, a suspension with an emulsion, like you you mentioned it, or you could work with uh, crystals. You can work with crystals if you make the crystal sufficiently thin, right? So th there are techniques that you can make a crystal that is uh, half a micron thick, but it is very challenging because you have uh, all the you know parasitic uh, optical challenges coming from dichroism, birefringence, and, you know, the, the results depend on the orientation of the crystal because the crystal is anisotropic, right? So nanocrystals suspended in water make it possible to look at solid state kinetics and photochemistry the way you would look at proteins, right? You know, so the, there are protein complexes that are 40, 50, 100 nanometers, and you do, Everything that you do, you do in solution, you suspend them in solution. So the nanocrystals are a little bit like that. The nanocrystals can be thought of as a, a state of matter in transition between supramolecular systems and bulk solids. So, okay. so you know, they're, they're very friendly. So, you know, any, any laser flash photolysis system can be used to measure transient kinetics in, in nanocrystalline suspensions. Thank you. Thank you. There is, there is another question also from uh, Professor Mari. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your excellent talk. She says, have you been able to follow these crystal to crystal reactions by using synchrotron X-ray uh, radiation? Actually, we, we really haven't. So the, the, there are groups, uh, you know, in various parts of the world that have been able to use a laser pulse and then use synchrotron, synchrotron pulse uh, excitation and collect data uh, on, on the kinetics from the crystal structure. Uh, so we, we have not been able to do that, uh, but, it, but it is a wonderful technique that is, is getting more and more powerful. It's currently it's challenging, right? But it's uh, nonetheless uh, very interesting. I, I can comment quickly that what we have been able to do is we can get the crystal structure of crystals that are 100 to 200 nanometers by using microelectron diffraction. Right. And I have to brag that one of the inventors of microelectron diffraction is my colleague at UCLA, Jose Rodriguez. Jose is, of course, Mexican who emigrated to the United States when he was a child. And he's just a brilliant, brilliant structural uh, chemist. But in those cases, I recall that uh, by dealing with the very, very small uh, crystals, you could probably have a different polymorph than the one that you grow uh, at uh, large specimens for single crystal X-ray diffraction in in house, right? That is possible. Yes. So you know, one always need to confirm whether the identity of the face in the nano crystals is the same as the identity of the face of the bulk solid or or large crystals. Okay. Thank you. There is another question. So uh, from uh, Professor Gabriel Merino, he says, uh, "Thanks, Miguel, for a very interesting talk." The examples you show are such as that you can remove CO. Is it possible to remove other stable molecules like water or, or is only what is special? What is so special about CO? The, actually, there is nothing special about CO. It's just that it's a model system that we've been look at looking for a, for a long time. But you know, I, I showed an example of a diazo compound where you extrude nitrogen. We look at diacetines that also extrude nitrogen. There are examples where you can extrude carbon dioxide. Uh, so, you know, it really depends again on, on the energetics of the molecule and uh, wh whether, you know, the, the bond dissociation energies and there is a state correlation between the excited state and the, the intermediates with the, where the bonds are clean. But no, there, there is really nothing, nothing special. So you can think about losing SO2, SO, you know, sulfur dioxide, sulfur monoxide, things like that. So a small, in fact, you can think about, about also losing ethylene or acetylene in a, in a retro Diaz-Alder type reaction or things like that. So, you know, the fact that the, it, from what we can tell, what's important is that the molecular energetics are such that the excited state correlates with intermediates that are downhill and the, there is no significant activation energy along the excited state, state surface. But, and also for for the uh, stability of the radical that you you end up with, right? So if in in the cases you show, uh, you have a phenyl 
phenyl groups and methyl groups. So it's a it's a tertiary uh, radical or secondary radical, it, I don't know, it, but uh, right. it, that can also contribute to, to the stability. Uh, absolutely. So the it, it is interesting because the, the the stability of the radical is what determines the exothermicity of the reaction. Right. So so our observation and calculations also indicates that you, you, you really need in a crystal uh, pi substituents that will delocalize the radical in, you know, in a, in a, by resonance uh, because a tertiary radical will not cleave. But if you have a vinyl, alkynol, aromatic, um, you know, or captodative effects, then, then, then they will cleave. Thank you. There is another question from Professor Jorge Tiburcio Simbestab. Uh, for the photosalient effect, do you have an idea how to harness the mechanical force so to obtain macroscopic and directional motion? Uh, uh, hi, Jorge. Thanks for the question. That is a great question. In fact, uh, uh, the, the crystal that I show in one of the slides from the work of uh, Masahiro Irie, he, in the same paper where he published that example, he had a beautiful uh, example of how he used a, a, a crystal to activate or to actuate a, a gear. So photochemically at a distance, he was making the, the crystal basically bend in a way that it would then push the gear step by step. So, so he was basically transducing photochemical motion into macroscopic mechanical motion. And the, the, the way he was doing it again is by using light coming into different directions of the crystal to control the, the bending angle and the, 